So hi everybody, it's the, the church beside me start ringing the bells, so I guess it's four o'clock. Uh, so we can we can start. I've seen the I've seen the schedule for today, and I'm really I'm, and I mean I've seen the, uh, the speeches in the parallel groups. So I'm glad that you've chosen. Mm. Uh, this talk about Federa Copper and I believe I can tell you some interesting stories about behind the scenes of maintenance of Federa Copper instance. So hello, I'm Pavel. Uh, I'm the engineer at Red Hat. I'm working on uh, on Copper code, and Miroslav is my colleague and and manager at Red Hat Hacker. Yes. Yeah. Well. And if you will have any question during this presentation, don't hesitate to write it in the chat. And I will try to answer it. So, at the beginning, something about statistics. Currently, we have about 3,000 active users who maintain about 19,000 of projects. And this eats about 13 terabytes of data in terms of packages and uh, metadata and repositories on the Copper backend side. Back a few years ago, we started with, I think, four terabytes uh, volume in AWS EC2, and we slowly increased it. We have a nice how to increase the volume on, a, let's say, monthly basis uh, without interruption. And nowadays we are at 16 terabytes. And fun is that this is the maximum value for, for the volume size. So in the next months, we will have to migrate somewhere else. We do backups using uh, automatic weekly uh, snapshots. And currently, during the last quarter, we were able to build like 80,000 builds a day, approximately. But uh, the previous quarter was slightly higher. I don't know. It maybe uh, relates to some Fedora uh, release cycle or something. That was about 12,000 of builds a day. And in peaks, it's about 50 gigabytes of, of package data a day. So that's, that's the reason why we are doing a lot aggressive cleanups. You probably know that uh, we allow only one version of each package in one project or in one shroud. Uh, we offer several um, RFEs for automatic project removals or a maximum number of builds in, in one repository and so on, because otherwise we would be able to uh, eat all the data very quickly. So we, need some, we needed some tool to better understand uh, how, how folks are using the storage. So there is a, uh, there is a new uh, page where you can take a look. There are some interesting uh, data about uh, what architectures are eating, how much, how much storage users, uh, projects, and so on. And I would like to, uh, I would like to point out that uh, the last year was really a year of packet, at least in terms of storage, because they multiplied the storage use like five times during the year of 21. And another interesting chart, uh, you can see here how important for us is the Fedora end of life policy. You know that we always send the email and uh, we give you another half a year for preserving the data. And after that, we are removing it. Uh, when you take a look at the first arrow on the on the on this slide, uh, the red one, uh, you can see that's the point. Uh, that's the time when we announced the end of life uh, started, and within the first two weeks, each each ballot in that in that line is uh, is uh, one week. You can see that we removed the duplicates, and uh, then uh, the consumption is about flat for the rest of the half a year preservation pre period, and then the green one shows the time when the data are removed. Yes, there still stays some kind of, I mean, 30 gigabytes of data stay because some uh, some folks uh, opt in to preserve the data longer for, for any reason. It's it's good that they can do that. Similar, similar thing is happening with Fedora 34. Uh, that's, the, that's the line above that and the second red arrow. And maybe even in more interesting is the the black arrow in the in the slide. And back then, when we were staring at, at this going up and up, uh, we thought that actually 
something is very interesting about uh, Fedora 35 that it's it's going so high and so quickly. And eventually, when it started to catch up with the Fedora Rawhide uh, storage consumption, it appeared weird, and we started debugging it, and we found a bug in the pruning mechanism. So we fixed it, and we saved like two terabytes of data, uh, which saved us, basically. But while I'm showing it to you, it's, it's really important for us to, to take care of the storage consumption here. So the top peak, I at least I remember, was time when, when we built like 50,000 builds a day. And we were not on a limit. Most of the traffic was done by us and by uh, Fedora, Fedora uh, Python team and probably Rust those days. And Copra is designed so, so the throughput is not eaten by three, three people or three teams. So we have limits and copper should be usable even in such peaks. So, and I mean, even back those days, we had to limit like 25 concurrent builds in, in one project. Nowadays, we increase the quota a bit. Uh, one user can run 45 uh, builders in parallel and uh, 35 in one sandbox, which basically is uh, one project and some other security policies. So yes, you can run 45 builders or 45 builds at one time, but you have to split it across at least two projects. And currently we can run up to 30, 300 builders in, uh, in parallel. And this is kind of, uh, I mean, theoretical number. We can go up uh, and down. We have flexible allocation mechanisms, so typically we have something about 100 builders, but it can go up to this if it's if it's needed. Historically, uh, there was a Fedora, a Fedora infrastructure-driven OpenStack, and we had only um, x86 and PowerPC Little Endian boxes there, and we needed to, I mean. Users wanted to have other architectures, so we started experimenting and we implemented uh, uh, emulated builds using RPM Force Arch. And then other people came in that it's not enough, that the build don't work, and that they ne need the native builders. So at this moment in time, we run, I mean, most of the x86 builders on our hardware in Fedora Lab, um, and we fall back to AWS. There is a S S390 support natively in IBM Cloud. PowerPC Little Indian is again in Fedora Lab mostly. There are two Power 8 machines and one Power, Power 9 machine, and we fall back to Oregon, Oregon State University OpenStack. And ARM64 is in AWS only. The architecture ARM32 stays emulated at this moment. So at this, at this slide, I, I'd like to thank to all the cloud providers that that gave us the computational power for, for the community purposes. So historically, it was quite easy. We, we had uh, one simple playbook starting a homogeneous set of builders in the OpenStack in Fedora infrastructure. But later, we had to uh, move to a different lab. Uh, the OpenStack was decommissioned. Uh, we started spreading across several clouds and we maintained several several hypervisors. So we need something to keep the maintenance of the builders sane. That's that's why the resource allocation client server in, uh, architecture was created, the resource server, uh, which allows us to provide kind of easy configuration in terms of in terms of uh, shell scripts that that just start and stop. Uh, VMs in pre-configured pools, and we can add more as, as needed. This gives us the flexibility, like we don't start too many AWS machines when that's not needed. And yeah, it it was quite hard to uh, like show you, but uh, recently Sylvia and Jakub implemented a nice page for where I can show you, you can take a look there on how many resources are currently started in copper and and the pools uh, i've i've done one screenshot about the i mean as i said uh, 
architecture uh, ARM64 is currently run only in, a in AWS. And uh, the pool looks like that we can start up to 30, 30 builders when we need that. Uh, currently, there is 17, 17 builders up and running. Five of them are ready to be taken. If you came to Copper and you want that builder, you, you will get it. And 12 of them are doing something. And you can see that one is starting and one is currently deleting. So something, something like that. The point is to do zero babysitting, basically. Unless you write to us or some monitoring uh, shouts at us, we don't take care. Uh, it, it just does its, its, its job. This, this software is decoupled from Copra, so if you needed something like that, if you face similar issues, you can take a look and use it. Yeah, so we need to start VMs and we need to stop them very frequently. The reason is that, uh, uh, the reason is security. Uh, we cannot simply uh, let the users build RPMs because building in RPMs is done in mock and mock installs RPM. For that, you need to have a root. So since, you, since we give the users root powers, they can come and break the builder, poison that, and and affect other users. So therefore, we never give the uh, VM you are using to other users and vice versa. Uh, we cannot, uh, I mean, because we need to start it very frequently, we cannot simply uh, use Kickstart and install them because that would take too long. We cannot even use the pre-prepared Fedora, Fedora images uh, from Fedora download cloud and so on, because we need special packages there, configuration, and we need to update the packages frequently. So we periodically prepare our own golden images, and this is currently pain. Uh, for multiple clouds, uh, we have to do multiple different things. The major, uh, I mean, even the majority uh, images are done with weird sysprep, but the problem is that our hypervisors are mostly on the stable RHEL 8. And as you probably know, Fedora Cloud migrated to BTRFS, so Fedora 35 and newer uh, images are based on BTRFS file system, and RHEL 8 kernel doesn't support B BTRFS. So it is kind of a problem, not impossible, but it makes us headaches. So at this moment, we are poking at Image Builder. The problem is that Image Builder doesn't support Fedora on S390 and uh, PowerPC Little Endian. I mean, Image Builder supports uh, Fedora and supports the architectures, but not this particular combination. So we are stuck for several months waiting for this to be supported. So. Uh, Many, many uh, the peaks in the traffic are generated often by a few people in a few very large projects. Uh, here is a nice link to a blog post about that. We, we tried to uh, rebuild wo I mean, all the RubyGem packages in games into RPMs in this project, and there is a blog post about that. Feel free to take a look. But the point is, I mean, we can parallelize a lot. We can start 35 builders at one moment in that. And most of the projects are built very quickly, like within one minute or so. So this is, this is super nice. Uh, but at the, at the end of the build, you need to put the RPMs into the repositories and generate the metadata. And this cannot be parallelized. I mean, there are 35 builders coming and trying to update the metadata, and they are waiting for a look. And there is a lot of I.O. in this in this thing. Create report needs to read the RPM, actually, and to const and construct it. So since beginning, we are using the update option for create repo, simply to not read the RPMs that are already in the metadata. But that was not enough. So we started using skip stat. Uh, the, the funny thing is that this option actually I mean, users uh, of this option are in the official documentation mentioned to be gullible. So, but yeah, we, we, we know what we are doing. We have a complete uh, knowledge about what 
RPMs are modified or, or removed or added. So we can afford using that. But guess what? It was not enough again. So we implemented the recycled package list. So we don't actually have to tra uh, traverse all, all, the, all the RPMs in the repository because there are hundreds of thousands of them. And even that generates a lot of IO. So now with that option, we can rely on, on the set of RPMs from the previous version of the metadata. So good, but still not enough. Uh, the CPU consumption in a create repo is uh, very, very big. And uh, actually, it doesn't make much sense to recalculate it all the time for all, for all the workers. Uh, if there are 35 of them, why to recalculate it uh, 35 times? So we implemented so-called batched create repo. And one of those workers is promoted to be the leader and is able to calculate uh, the jobs for all the all the waiting workers on the lock. And when it's once it's done, all the workers are unblocked. So that's cool. It was it was much better, the truth put, but it was again not enough. And create repo was, I mean, after some time when the, the Ruby Gems repository grew up, it was taking like half an hour to uh, increment or update the repository. And uh, last time, uh, uh, last month uh, came Daniel from the satellite team and he was finally able to optimize out 85% of the time. So since the new release, we should be able to regenerate the, the largest repository in Copper in like five minutes, which is which is cool, much better than before. Could be better, but, but cool. Another problem in terms of uh, a metadata, metadata repository is upstream, upstream builder. It takes a lot of time. Uh, there, not that it would be uh, uh, suboptimal, but it doesn't know how to do incremental uh, updates. So we ended up with uh, official instructions that, hey, if you are maintaining too large copy repository, turn this tool off and don't provide upstream metadata because it's simply too slow and you would face a uh, build failures. And yeah, uh, even DNF is kind of, kind of slow. Uh, and I was kind of lying to you on the previous slide that builds in those repositories are fast. We definitely cannot make them in one minute. Even though the build itself takes like 15 seconds, the extreme example is the large repository and the DNF needs to actually load the metadata and that takes uh, like six minutes. Uh, even on my on my uh, really fast, uh, I, I don't know, i7 laptop, it takes like five minutes to calculate, I mean, to load the metadata from XMLs to cache them and load them into memory. And in Copper, we by default have the mock uh, bootstrapping feature on. So in that case, the DNF needs to be called twice. So that's twice six minute blocks just loading the metadata. Then the build goes, I mean, you install the dependencies, that's fast. You build the package, it's super fast. And then you need to do the create repo task, which takes five minutes. So in total, we are at 20 minutes for just 15 seconds RPM build. That's, that's not that bad, uh, not, not that good, I mean. Uh, at the end of the day, we can run 35 concurrent builds in one project. So it aggregates like more than one build per, sec per minute. So yeah, but could be better. Uh, historically, we, we had problems with hanging builds, some, some problems, some loop in test suite or waiting for the input, input. And we had to like babysit the builds and take a look at, hey, this is here longer than we would expect. Should we kill it? Will the, will the user be affected or is it, I mean, yeah. So we implemented uh, timeouts. The, the issue was what timeout we should pick. Uh, the way we approach this, I mean, there is no, no, no good answer. So eventually we took uh, kernel builds. The, those are done in copper very frequently. 
it's it in average it took like four hours so we gave it a five hours default timeout that might seem to be ages for your builds or it might be too low uh, so if you build some i mean it's configurable per build so if you if you build something that builds for five minutes and you have broken spec file that sometimes hangs feel, feel free to lower this value or if you build, for example, the Blink web engine, Chromium or something like that, uh, feel free to prolong it. The, the maximum value for, for this is 48, 48, uh, 48 hours, yes, two days. Okay, fun facts. Do you know what this string on these three lines means? And the hint is Ruby gems. Correct. Miro is correct. It's a it's a package name of one ruby uh, of one gem, and as as I said, we tried to rebuild all ruby gems as RPMs in one copy repository, and we did it in a batch. I mean, as long as the gems uh, had had good license, we tried that, and this one was 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 the longest package name, and it caused us a lot of troubles. Uh, the the build was triggered. It was continuously getting new and new resources, retries, and we was we were not able to even terminate that. We had to go straight to the database and remove it because that was a huge headache. This this is fixed now, so you don't have to try it. But yeah, that was that was fun. There is there is also a new feature with the batches. Uh, like you can chain builds of groups of uh, packages and put the dependency in between the batches. Like first set is built first and the dependency batch is built after that uh, this is heavily used by the fedora llvm team they are using it for daily snapshots and actually their batches are not able to finish within 24 hours so nowadays basically anytime you go to the fedora front page uh, fedora copper front page you see something doing there some batches from the llvm team and that's because they are building uh, this daily snapshot for today and for the previous day and maybe even older, I don't know. Uh, Fedora, uses, uh, Fedora Copper uses uh, for, for signatures the OBS sign software and by default it uses SHA1 hash algorithm and you may know that this this was distrusted in Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, 9. So unfortunately, eventually we found out that we are signing all the packages in Copper with wrong signature. So we started, we migrated Copper to the SHA-256 and all the new packages have this signature, but we didn't want to resign all the 13 terabytes of data of packages that would take too long. So simply we resigned only the packages for Red Hat Enterprise Linux 9, EPL 9, uh, to allow them to be installed and that's it. Users often want from us more power powerful builders for, for tasks like building Chromium or so. Uh, and that's basically basically there we could do that. We, of course, couldn't uh, start that many builders as we have now if they were more, more beefy, but we could have two types of builders. We just need to do some tweaks in the web UI, in, in the UI to allow users to specify appropriate tags. Uh, folks often want to automatically rebuild packages in repositories if they rebuild some dependency, like full package depends on bar, bar changes i want to automatically rebuild the full package this this is to be discussed with koshay koshay team and we hopefully will some find find some some way to implement this and very often question is like can i build in fedora copper something that's proprietary or something that cannot be shared with public and the answer is no because because the legal issues and second the computational power is given to us for, for community purposes. So, so no, but uh, there's a pull request on this, on this link where you can look uh, 
it should be easy in the future to start your own uh, Copra build system if you want that very easily, hopefully. So that, that would be it. I'm really glad that I could give this, this talk and uh, happy building, unless you have any questions. And uh, yeah, I'm really into packaging and build systems. So feel free to grab me on the Fedora Build Sys channel on LiberaChat. I will be happy, happy to talk to you. So we had uh, several questions in the QA and, and try to answer them uh, during during your sessions. Uh, is there any any other questions which we may answer uh, live here, here here in the session? If you have something, you can write in chat. I'm not sure if you can ask directly. Uh, probably not. Uh, David Duncan said, yeah, Pavel, I got your number now. I'll likely be asking your packaging now. <laughs> OK. I'll be happy to answer. <laughs> OK, so here is one question. Uh, what are folks' favorite text-based fast track to first copper build? Favorite text based, uh, something so. So, do we have something text based, so command line interface, uh, e something easy to do first copper build, Pavel? Yes, there is a copper client. Uh, the package is called, called uh, uh, copper dash click. And using that, I mean, hit it in the command line and it will show you all the help you need. Yeah, it's intuitive. Copra, Copra create, uh, it will pro create a project, Copra build, and you can pass it source RPM or link to source RPM, um, or you can build directly from PyPI or BGEMS. There's option and it's well documented. Yeah, yeah larger file system. There's a plan to do some research about cluster or maybe do some uh, some rate solution we don't know yet we don't know yet we will for the record i repeat a question what have you considered for extending the file system so 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 the answer i answered it in chat so elastic file system from from uh of from AWS, which can extend infinitely, uh, we can we can we con we will consider Pulp, which has a three uh, backend uh, as well, uh, which can grow indefinitely as well, or just use uh, Gluster FS and spin up virtual machines and load uh, load the bricks across several machines. That's option. We just have to consider pros and uh, cons. We have some other features in in mind in queue, so we have to consider that as well. Just not the file storage itself. Yeah, with the, with the EFS, there's other uh, option to consider the uh, the price because the AWS uh, bill for frequently uh, you know, accessed files more often. And when we uh, prune the repo, we access a lot of files during that. So we have to check uh, what will be our billing. Uh, we actually get the, the price from AWS for free. It's, they sponsor us, but, but still we have to somehow watch our builds so it doesn't spin up in the sky. So there are questions in the Q and A. Yeah. Uh, I think I, I can go through them, but we are out of time. So just just quickly, the OBS uh, versus Copper. There is a nice set of blog posts by Mirek. If you Google for Miroslav Suchy OBS yeah. research, you can you can get answers there. Uh, do you provision AWS machines on demand or those VMs? Or are those VMs available? Uh, always available. Uh, we, um, yes, that's the Resalog server. We are allocating as many as they are currently needed. We have some pre-allocated, but just a few of them, and we allocate as the demand goes goes up. Uh, 
Uh, would it be better if you could make uh, builds with XFS2? Uh, that's answered by Mirek. By we, already answered, we have one last thing which you know, is not answered. What about the fast track for contributing things that don't have a source RPM yet? Uh, I don't think I understand the question. Uh, so something doesn't have source RPM, so it has to be somehow created. For that, we have uh, yeah. uh, the um, how we call it Pavel, uh, the the method where you can put any script uh, and create the source RPM uh, during the build time. Uh, that's one of the supported methods. So you just provide a script which create the source RPM. We call it. Uh, we will execute it. Create the source RPM. Store it into our internal disk git and build from that. So just 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 provide us with the script uh, in, in the web UI and you can do it very easily. Yes, and as long as your package right. is in PyPI, uh, you can use the pip to spec method, which generates the spec file for you for free. So the, all, all you yep. need to know is the name of the of the package, basically in the PyPI. And we already ran out of the space uh, time and people are leaving. So uh, whoever is still here, thank you for your time. Uh, uh, and if you will have any questions about copper, don't hesitate uh, to chat with us uh, on our copper pages. You you will have uh, links where you can find us, RSC, uh, our mailing list, etc. Enjoy the rest of the conference and happy building. Bye bye.